Here we are again at the CPTSD podcast. Uh, this is the topic that I have been excitedly waiting for all of season two. So you're going to love it. I'm really happy about it. So let's go ahead and we'll see you inside. Welcome back to the CPTSD podcast, everybody. If this is your first time, we're so glad you're here. If you've been along with us for a bit, welcome back. Today, my colleague Beth Pace and I are going to be speaking about responsibility, blame, and the difference between those two. Also, how did that set you up for CPTSD? And what can you do about it now? So as always, I'm Tabitha Bird Weaver. I'm a duly licensed therapist in the state of Oregon. I provide clinical services and uh, supervision for clinicians out here. Beth Pace, Elizabeth Pace is a licensed uh, professional counselor supervisor in Louisiana, providing therapy services there and supervision there. So Beth, here we are talking about something we've talked about off our podcast a lot of different times. Do you want to start us off with some ideas about what we're talking about here with responsibility? Yes, please. <laughs> and blame. All right. It reminds me of, um, of season one when I, I, I was interrupting you because I was so excited. And sometimes I would just be like bouncing in my chair. Uh, that's how I feel about this topic, frankly, because it's extremely confusing um, for our clients frankly, for their parents, like this is part of the intergenerational soup that you get kind of born into. No fair. Um, so starting with the beginning, starting at the very beginning, which is a very good place to start. If you have parents or caregivers who had unmet needs from childhood, then they can't transmit something to you that they have not got. Meaning, if they were not cared for adequately, nurtured, mirrored, we may need to take some time to describe that one more time, or you can go back to some earlier episodes in season one. But basically what I mean is, if your parents did not get their developmental needs met in childhood, they may be using you to meet their developmental needs. This can look a lot of ways. Some of them can be that kind of classic, um, I'm mom's best friend, that kind of smothering where mom is using you to get her own nurturance needs met and you're trapped. You can't leave. You don't get to say, I actually don't want to be your best friend. <laughs> you could do that to another first grader, but you can't look at your mom and be like, you know, I actually don't like being friends with you. So you're kind of stuck. Like you are, you're trapped and your parents are using you to get their developmental needs. That's one way. Another way can be that kind of other end of the spectrum, which is a very angry parent who is taking out their own depression, despair um, on you. So parents are responsible for taking care of their children. Yep. Parents who are not equipped to do that don't take responsibility for caring for their children. And then they look at their children and say, the reason I can't care for you is because you're bad. Yep. Because you're not good enough is because you, there was a mark and you almost made it, but you didn't. And as the, as the beginning of how complicated this is, Parents are responsible for caring for their children. Yes. Parents who can't do that usually also can't take responsibility for their inadequacy. So they look down at the most powerless person in the system and go, this is because of you. It's not because of me. What do you want to add to that? Uh, the first thing I would add is that if that has happened in your life and your parent won't acknowledge it, welcome to the club. That's part of the whole thing right. we're talking about here. And why as an adult, it can be remarkably difficult to get any type of progress or even closure around the relationships we've had with our caregivers, because to the end, they won't 
take responsibility. And some might say can't. I don't disagree with that, but it feels like won't. So, you know, that's what it felt like from my perspective. And if you're dealing specifically with somebody who has some type of personality disorder, so kind of further along on that spectrum of lacking skills and insight, um, they will double down. They will double down. Like, see, Tabitha, you're still being difficult. Right. So I just wanted to say this is a cruddy, crappy experience from beginning to end. And you may have to make some choices along the way about how you're going to shift. And we'll get to that in a few minutes. One of the things I wanted to um, jump in and add, and maybe this should go for like later in, in the time we have today, I've actually heard my clients and other people tell me that they have had these extremely destructive caregivers turn around one day and then say something like, I know what I did. Now I'm sorry. I'd like you to forgive me so that I can move on to uh, step 10. Uh, the example of like the, the dad who like came to one of my clients and was like, so uh, I'm on step nine in uh, AA. I need to tell you I'm sorry. And uh, if you can hurry up and be like, yeah, I forgive you, then I can move on to step 10. And their kid was just like, whatever, dad. <laughs> like, okay, whatever. <laughs> I'm sorry doesn't actually mean anything if what that parent means is absolve me of, the, of responsibility. Unsurprising newsflash. That's the same thing as yep. childhood. Same thing. You are responsible for making me feel better. Um, and yeah, like Tab the point that Tabitha is making, it doesn't always end in childhood, um, depending on how close your relationships are with, um, with these people, uh, how much you see them, how often. Uh, but related to where it comes from, coming back to early childhood, um, you as a child, you as a small person under 12, a lot of my clients would say to me that around 12, 13, 14 was when things started to really go off the rails because they started to have some sort of a sense of the fact that things were wrong or that their parents, um, they didn't like their child developing an identity in their own autonomy. So uh, if you're only listening, Tabitha just raised her hand like, yeah, me. Um, and you nailed it. Yeah. If you start to challenge them with your own autonomy, which is developmentally what you're supposed to be doing. Yep. It's going to, they double down. Right. All right. Sorry yeah. to interrupt there. I just got excited about saying that. Bingo. Yeah. <laughs> Sinful, shameful, uh, recalcitrant, disobedient, uh, slutty, you name it. Anything yep. you want. Just like, you got it. They'll tell it to you. Um, so, yeah, depending on how, how much you know, I, I, how much autonomy you are capable of building uh, at that time in your young life, things can get worse. But if you're under 10, you don't actually have any sort of psychological buffer between you and this person. So when they tell you that you're bad, you believe it. When they tell you that you um, are disobedient, then you go, okay, well, these, these rules must be like reasonable. And the only problem here is that I'm disobedient. Um, a personal example, which is super confusing. Uh, when I was a very little kid, and maybe, I don't know if I've shared this on the podcast or not. I was a very little child, maybe like seven. Um, I, there were some holes in those like foam 80s placemats. You know what I'm talking about. If that's like around a time and era, uh, foam placemats, love that. And my caregiver was like, you put these holes in these placemats. And I was like, that definitely seems like a thing I would do, but I didn't do it. And they were like, but yeah, you did. And I was like, no, I, I definitely didn't. So I'm telling the truth, which is that I didn't do it. Uh, I have no memory of doing it because I didn't. And they're looking at me and going, you're lying. So in order for you to get out from under this like psychological trap that you're in right now, that you literally cannot escape, um, you're going to need to lie to say that you did it. And then apologize for lying earlier when you were telling the truth, just so you can get your punishment and we can move on. Mm -hmm. This is terrible. <laughs> really terrible. Right. And when I was older, maybe like five years ago, I watched this friend of mine who's a mother. These two, her two children came up to her and were like, Mom, 
sibling did this, sibling did this. And she looked at them both and she was like, I can't tell which one of you guys is lying. So I can't intervene here. What I am going to do is just take this toy away right now. And then in a couple of minutes, if you guys want to play with it some more, we'll set a timer and everybody can have their own time. And I was gobsmacked. I was like, so she can't tell who's wrong. She can't tell whether or not anybody did anything. So she's not going to do any type of intervention. Blew my mind. Blew my mind. Including abuse them by telling them they're the problem. Right. Beautiful. Oh. Yeah. I bet that turned your head. Yeah, I was shocked. Um, and so is there anything you want to add to the, the parents giving too much responsibility to a child. I think there are other much more subtle ways than kind of overt abuse that this happens. Oh, mean? for sure. I mean, yeah, I, there are, th this is a spectrum like everything else or, you know, or uh, there's intersectionality that happens here. And so I think the thing that I would add is that um, it may seem innocent on the outside, this behavior, like they don't understand what they're doing, or maybe they don't realize the impact that it would have on you as a child or moving throughout your lives. Um, there is some truth to the fact, though, that this is planned and premeditated behavior, because the goal of this behavior is for the parent or caregiver to keep whatever fragile ego state they have intact. Mm -hmm. So they they will twist and change things so that it fits their scenario, which is Beth, as you've been saying, confusing. Yeah. Really confusing. And so if you're feeling flooded or overwhelmed or like you don't know what the heck is going on right now because these are new ideas to you or you're seeing it in a new way, yeah, we know. That's exactly that's exactly it. And there are some stages that we're going to talk about about the awakening to this and then, you know, before you even take a next step. Yeah. What what should you pay paying attention to? Do you want to kick us off with that? Um, I've got a couple more things I want to add because okay, great. Are, um, even though, you know, I've heard Tabitha say, and I think that it's really coming from a compassion place of like possible, can, some may say can't, I wouldn't kick that out of bed. Here's the reality. You as an adult are taking actions right now to heal your trauma and whether or not therapy was like a thing that people went to in the 1920s or 30s. Um, you could talk to your priest, you could talk to another family member, you could talk to a neighbor about how like, man, sometimes my kids really push my buttons. Um, so to say that the people who raised us had no responsibility whatsoever, um, or like couldn't have done anything better than they did, we want to just imbue this conversation with choice. Because mm. if we believe that you who are listening are not pathologically doomed, to recreate these patterns, then we also have to believe based from that same framework that these people had choices, choices. Um, one of the sweetest gifts of my life actually is that my mother is in like a pretty, a pretty powerful place of recovery. She didn't go to trauma therapy, but she did some work on herself. And so that when the day came that I was like, I need to tell you, that you were abusive and I know it. And she was like, yeah, I know. I know I was. So um, I will reflect to you that um, there are some parents who will never, ever take responsibility. And there are some parents that will. Mm -hmm. um, when you needed them to, perhaps not. So, you know, when I, when I, when I asked my mom to read the case study I wrote about complex post-traumatic stress disorder, she did. And then nice. she- she was like, you know what? I really ache for your client, but I can really see where her parents are coming from too. And I was like, I bet you can. Of course, right? To be trapped in the middle. And then, and when I say trapped in the middle, what I mean is most of the time, and I do believe this, most of the time, the parents who are transmitting trauma and low self-esteem to their children are indeed doing a better job than was done to them. But if the bar for what parenting means by that definition is that low, you could just not punch your kid in the face and be like, I'm a better dad than I had. Come on. Or you could just be present instead of disappearing for six months out of the year, drunk, 
come home, beat everybody up and then leave again. If you just stayed, even though you were totally dissociated and emotionally absent, you could go to sleep at night based on your own understanding and go, oh, pretty good dad, pretty good parent. So it's, it, that's why there's like a lot of subtlety, a lot of confusion and a lot of nuance. These people did know that they were hurting you. Yep, they did. <laughs> they knew it. They knew it. And I think one of the things that can be remarkably painful about that is um, that they may not do the work required to repair relationship with you. Yep. And you are still responsible to repair relationship with you. Here we go. With Thank you. God. That is a, right. yeah, that is a perfect segue into waking up in adulthood. Yeah. And it, it's usually very, very painful. Right. So I just want to slow down for a second and I'm like looking at you with, as much as I can in the camera to tell you if you were realizing that it's not all your fault and that it was pretty twisted, the stuff you heard, I understand you're not alone. It's going to take some work to get there and it's work your caregivers refuse to do. Mm -hmm. So just be prepared. You're going to have to find your own way and not use them as an example. And we'll get into the the other you know stages of how this, I got a little excited there, evolves, how this is going to evolve for you. But one of the things I had to do just to anchor you into some reality, one of the things I had to do is start to use my parents as a negative example of what I didn't want to be instead of this unfulfilled, oh, I want them to love me experience, right? So if that is true for you, that you need to be like, whatever I do, it's not going to be that. That's okay. Yeah, that's an okay place to start. Right. And you're probably right now starting to come out of denial, so, which is built into the system. This is built in. And that's why there's some intention here. Our need to continue to deny that our caregivers harmed us is built into the system of them helping us internalize our own judgment of self. So it keeps us stuck in denial. Yeah. What are your thoughts about that, Beth? Well, it's a, like I said, it's a really perfect segue into um, into the like waking up into adulthood. So I'm going to touch back into what the theme is today, which is um, responsibility versus blame. So you are you may be moving through your world in this way where you um, you blame yourself for everything. Everything that's not going well, you are blaming yourself. This is, there's plenty of evidence for why I'm a total piece of garbage. Every time I try to do anything, it doesn't work out. I am picking the same types of people over and over again for relationships. They're destructive and so on. And so you, you grow because of the environment that you were raised in into an adult that is excellent at blaming yourself. And frankly, the, uh, the shadow side of that is and blaming other people, systems, the world for the way that it is. So when you first kind of wake up to the fact that you were traumatized instead of the fact that you're terrible and the world is terrible, this is kind of earth shattering. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, every time I think about this type of change, you know, that that old DJ on the record, that's what happens in my brain. <laughs> and it's like you have to deal with the cognitive dissonance that is going to come up for you. So, Beth, for me, the way I kept myself in denial for a lot of years was to blame my environment. Ah. Right. Like if it's too stressful, then I can't handle it. If it, you know, so I just wanted to say not only can that self blame put you into a place where you're blaming others or feeling like a horrible person, it can also paralyze you. Mm -hmm. Right. Because if you have to make a choice and it's all bad or you're all bad, where do you, where do you even go with that? So just pay attention to your own self and notice where you're at in this process. Where do you want to head next, Beth? Well, and so thinking about when it comes time that you become aware of the fact. So we're talking about, uh, Tabitha and I were talking before we started recording. It's almost like the strata, my, the layers of the, the planet, the layers of the rock. First layer that you got to bust through is denial. 
nothing is wrong. So for me and for a lot of the folks that I work with, perfectionism was how um, how self-blame manifested, meaning that if something was hard, I was going to ingress and do more in order to prove that I was totally in control. So self-blame um, or like over-responsibility, um, because again, it gets real murky. It can be, it, it looks so, it's so confusing um, that then you say, I am in control of everything and how it's going to go. And so you can kill yourself with workaholism. You can kill yourself trying to control other people's behavior, people, places, things, your own kids. I'm going to control my children into being the healthiest versions of themselves that they can ever get. <laughs> and your kids are just like, you know, what would be cool is if we could just leave the dishes in the sink for once and like hang out with each other. And you in your, you know, so that's when you were saying earlier about, um, a good, a, a good place to start sometimes is my parents are the opposite of what I want to become. I would agree with that. And then you've got to, you got to, you just got to keep waking up over and over again. Right. So if the, and if the other side of the pen, pendulum from like utter neglect is smothering because you understand it to be the, o- it's the only thing. If you think of the, what's the polar opposite of this, well, you know, letting your letting your kids sleep in bed with you until they're 10 is not doing them any favors, but you think you're doing the opposite of, you know, what was done to you. So the waking up part, um, there's a lot of anger. So mm. underneath denial, you break through the denial, you start really looking at the fact that um, no child deserved, deserves to be blamed for things that they haven't done. Uh, No child deserves to be belittled. Um, No child deserves to be shouldered or burdened with the responsibility of making their parents happy or making their parents, meeting their parents' low self-esteem needs by being excellent. The, the, The seat or the root of their parents' identity. No child deserves to go through that. It's crushing. Mm hmm so you build and, a little, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, and no child deserves to be responsible for maintaining the status quo in their environment and managing things. No child deserves to be put in front of the other parent so that they receive the issues, uh, the the attacks. And so I guess I just wanted to loop back to that. There may be rage in you. I know you're saying that, but back to, to pinch off the denial piece. Yeah. If you're listening to this, you're already in that stage where you're busting through denial. So please don't heap more work on yourself that you may have already done and allow yourself to move into the anger piece, which is what we're talking about now, because anger is appropriate in this situation. And if you don't release the anger, you're hurting yourself now at this point. Where were you going to head with anger, Beth? I lost the thread. Um, But as you said that, I'm glad because it, it cues me into how many times I have had clients who can touch sadness, maybe even sadness for their caregivers, but rage, anger is not a safe emotion for them to feel. And so we actually have to, uh, and I think we have talked about this in a previous episode and I'm not gonna be able to reference which one. Um, There is a difference between anger and aggression. Anger is just a feeling. It's hot. It's fiery. Sometimes it's heavy. Sometimes it's really gross. It makes you feel uncomfortable, but it's not aggressive behavior. So clients of mine will say, I told myself, I made a deal with myself that I was never going to get angry. Right. And that's, we have to parse out the difference between a feeling and a behavior. Breaking your partner's favorite plate that they made at the pottery place is aggressive behavior. Mm -hmm. Feeling angry at them is just an emotion. But if nobody taught you that, then you're trying to use blame to treat emotions. Ooh, anger's bad. I'm not supposed to feel that. Hold up. They're not the same thing. Anger and aggression are not the same thing. And 
I'm not going to say you got to feel it, but what Tabitha said, right, is that you, um, you're not hurting anybody by taking poison and expecting them to get sick. And, and it's a, yeah. And it's another version of us turning it inward. Yes. Which is our conditioning. Yes. Right. So you may feel problems with anger, either too much or too little, you know, depending on how that was expressed in your home growing up. So for example, if you had a parent who spun off with rage, you actually might be very comfortable with anger. That actually might not be a problem, the outward expression of anger, you know, where I would encourage you to look at that is, is that anger productive? Because that lashing out blaming piece is obviously not. It's what got you here. And turning it inward is not. So where is anger helpful? And in my experience, when I've had shut down clients, clients who think that they have depression, or maybe they do, the point is that that suppressed feeling that they get, mm -hmm. that we get. Yeah. Anger, I love seeing that come up. I love it because anger is a highly motivating emotion. That's why it burns. It's literally lighting a fire under you, right? So, I mean, if we were going to put this into the chakra system, now we're looking at third chakra and I can talk about that in another space, but if that intrigues you, look that up. So what do you think, what's our next step with anger, Beth? Where are you headed? Well, I was going to also make mention that anger is a good sign that your self-esteem is getting higher. So I will say to you that, um, you know, if, if you like it, you should check it out. Adult children of family dysfunction, the literature from their world service organization, usually very cheap, written by an anonymous person, AKA Claudia Black, who wrote, um, it will never happen to me. Um, even though she did that anonymously because she identified, it's anonymous. Um, that in there is this, this idea that once you start to realize, um, here's what I've got, here's what I got in my childhood. And you like, you realize how little love, nurturance, care, respect, boundaries, autonomy you received. Then you start to understand, well, here's what I deserved. And it's so much more than that. Mm. That I'm basically good and to be treated like I am basically good, that I'm doing my best. And that that's actually quite enough. The space between understanding what you got, which is not very much, and what you deserve, which is way more, that space is how much grief, anger, like how much emotional, uh, how much you have to process as mm -hmm. you're coming out. So coming out of denial gives you the awareness. Here's what I really got. Here's what I deserved. And now I have to feel all the stored pain, rage, sense of injustice, um, because all of those things were happening in your body when you were a child, which is how you learned, because you can't, you can tell yourself you're not feeling, but it's not been my experience that you, if you are alive and your heart is beating, that that's real. So we learn how to not show what we're feeling to others and to ourselves. Yep. But then the day comes that you have to go down, which is why Tabitha and I both use somatic therapy interventions is because you've got to go find what you stored and hid from yourself and release it. You absolutely do. Or you'll just be in the same loop with more insight, which actually can be quite a bit more painful than what you were doing before. Right. Yes. Right. So I just want to pop in or drop in a good news bomb here. Right. And, and the good news is that it's going to take a while to unwind this out of yourself. There's definitely processing that has to happen, but we have so much better therapy now than we did even a decade ago. Right. And it's more widespread and more easy to access, even though it's not feeling like it right now, there's still more than there was. So hook in there, find some support. Right. One of the things I wanted to say that can be really hard is that a lot of us were taught not to find help when we were growing up because we needed to keep it in the family or whatever, whatever the, the mantra was. As humans, I see you as humans are number one skill that is built into us innately is our cry for help. 
from birth. Think about it. Like other mammals, they're able to swim and run immediately. Like within seconds, you're seeing little baby horses get up and walk on those spindly legs. Not us. We cry. And so if you have had the experience of your cry being ignored, your cry being twisted, your cry being actually something that gets you in trouble, see if you can connect with some people in your life who are going to listen to your cry and support you. And I bet you already have them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, as you said that, I was also thinking about how that circles around to like over responsibility or blame. So you think to yourself, well, I don't really need therapy because nothing that bad really happened to me. Ellipsis. I should be able to control my life and its direction all alone. Yep. That, that, um, that unhealthy, like isolation. And I don't want to even call it independence because in, being independent is not bad, but being in control at the, um, at the loss of relationship or being able to help, like get help. Uh, yeah, I, I can't, those are the clients that I look at them and I go, how can I help? Because they mm. go, I just should be able to do this all, all by myself. I'm so mortified that I even have to be in this room. I don't want to tell you about my eating disorder. I don't want to tell you about like X, Y, and Z because nothing really happened to me other than being the, the recipient of my mother's abuse and smothering for 18 years. And I'm like, let me help. Um, and then sometimes when I would offer help, they, they would get really mad. And then in other times they would be like, why aren't you helping? And finally I looked at one of my clients and I was like, if you can't do push-ups on the floor, I'm not going to ask you to do push-ups on the floor. But if I ask you to do push-ups on the wall as a place to start, please don't beat me to hell about the fact that that's what I'm asking you to do because that's where we are right now. And they were like, huh. <laughs> because every because they were like it was so hard they were like i don't want to be here and then every time i was like okay well then are you here and they're like no um it was it's so hard so like that anger was like still coming up in that person's experience kind of as aggression both towards themselves and towards other people it was so painful mm. um, and you know luckily the end of that story is that they they got the help they needed um and that, that unthawing or like the defrosting phase of it was that bad. I, as an adult, am not responsible for saying, how bad was it? Go get into your body and see. See yep. what that was like for five-year-old you. There's a lot of information down there. Tons of information. And that I love the way that you're talking about that, like thawing, because as things are slowly coming to life, just like if you were getting hypothermia in your fingertips, it hurts when they warm up again, mm -hmm. but you need them to warm up to keep the fingers. Mm -hmm. mm. So after you're going through this anger piece, and it can take a, it can take a while to be there, right? Just I want to just give a pro tip. One of the best ways I've ever dispelled anger, and my clients report back that they love this too, is and I would really say this is more about rage where you're wanting to see some kind of impact from your emotion. Get a dozen eggs, go somewhere you don't have to clean it up and huck them at a tree or a wall because listen, it makes a sound. You can see where it was. I've attached ideas. Yeah, I've attached ideas or names to those things as I huck them. It's just really satisfying. And the reason I think it can be helpful is number one, you're getting insight and taking action. It's physical. You're moving some of that energy out of your body. Mm -hmm. Should we start? Go ahead, Breath. I'm glad you said that uh, because I, in my, you know, counseling graduate program in let's say 2020. So now, uh, nope, that's not it. 2010, uh, 12 years ago, um, the, the CBT, the cognitive behavioral therapy or sort of like European white male perspective is don't let anger come up. It's not healthy. The research shows that punching a pillow is bad for you. Listen, um, I think tab does what I, some, some similar things to what I do, which is like inner child healing, meaning that I don't need, um, you know, I don't need 
Aaron Beck's ghost, may he rest in peace, to tell me that I'm not allowed to be angry. Mm. If you listen to the Louise Hay book, You Can Heal Your Life, she's like, I had to go to a lot of therapy where I had to release a lot of anger, a lot of rage, so that there's nothing shameful and wrong about getting that anger out. So two Tabitha's like dozen eggs, I would encourage you to imagine inviting your inner child the age that they want to release the anger. Because if you try to bring your three-year-old and like adult expressions of anger freak her out, that's not what she wants. Take your 15-year-old self who's like, oh, this, these people. Right, that like releasing some of that anger and that frustration is actually good for you because what Tabitha and I are always talking about is like there's the difference between cycling up at an emotional um like high, like, like un, un, I don't want to say unhealthy, but like at a vibration where you're just fomenting more pain or like doing it in present day where you're, you're snapping at your partner, you're lashing out at people and you're just creating more pain for yourself. This is the kind where when Tab says and ideas, you can be like, I didn't put the holes in those placemats. Um, one of my clients told me that they would go to the um, antique store or just like the thrift store and buy, um, buy little saucers and go find a wall and like fling the saucers at the wall to watch them shatter. And that for them was like extremely satisfying. And then it meant that they like could release their rage in what felt like a more functional way. Fantastic. Yeah. Love it. And that bringing your inner child in, I think it's dead on, Beth, because when I'm really satisfied from an exercise like that, I'm younger, 9 to 12, 13, for sure. It's very satisfying. I also just want to float one more idea about anger, because then we'll, we'll scoot into the next phase, which for a lot of you is going to be some grief. Yeah. Um, and uh, anger is always about a boundary violation. Mm always now sometimes that anger is going to be about other people violating you like not caring for you in the way we're talking about right now right or violating a role that they have in your life but sometimes that anger is going to be about you violating yourself and we talked about this in our last podcast where i said yes to a pot a potluck i didn't want to take something to and now i'm mad you know about that so as you're going through this process 100 percent let, in your mind at least, let people be responsible for what they've done. Say the truth. But that also means you. And now I'm talking about you as your adult self. Yes. Because yeah. one of the places that I have had personally a lot of suffering in this area is recognizing the grief of this adorable little girl, me, of course, when I was little, didn't get what she needed. That's really sad. Just like sad and i've done that to other people um, and that's another layer of sad that's a different kind of sad so here we go how do you suggest people start to tap into their grief and understand the difference between grief and anger because those can be mixed a lot yeah so just to remind you guys like we're in we're in section three of today's outline which is in recovery responsibility it's yours. Mm -hmm. It's yours. Um, so um, I don't get, well, I mean, I can, but it's not bringing me the life I want. Um, I can look at my not clean house, for example, and go, well, the reason I don't know how to clean my house on a schedule is because, you know, I had a bunch of terrible stuff happen to me when I was a kid. That, listen, it is true that that happened to me as a child and as an adult if i can treat the blame then i can start actually taking action for responsibility you know what will help you with that podcasts you can use the <laughs> podcasts about how to clean with add it's lit i don't even have add but symptomology and presentations of like complex trauma and attention deficit disorder look alarmingly similar um, so when it comes to, when it comes to your present day, the reason that we have to treat the self blame first is because then you actually have the ability to build discipline in your present life without discipline, meaning punishment mm. and worthlessness. 
Yeah. Failure, pass, fail. Um, and so uh, someone said to me once, I, they, read, they read a definition of discipline as being the disciple of your own highest and wisest self. Discipline, if we have conflated discipline with punishment as a result of our upbringings, then we, so a, an example that someone has given me is they only clean when someone's about to come over because the pressure's on, or they only clean once everything gets so gross that they're like beating themselves up, which is the impetus into uh, changing. And one day they came to me and they were like, did you know, did you know that if I cleaned on a schedule, I would, I might not see the dirt that I was cleaning. And I was like, that's mind blowing. <laughs> it is mind blowing. Whoa. Yeah. If you did it when it was the day you did it, instead of waiting for like the vacuum cleaner to be like picking up the crunchy bits, you would be like, Oh, I'm just vacuuming because it's Tuesday. Um, and so I, I want to say this one more time. In recovery, this is why we have to treat self-blame is so that you can understand that responsibility is your gift. You are the gift is that you get to be the responsible party in your life. You. There's so much in that. And, and, and that might feel scary or big at first. That's normal. It's so satisfying. Because the power is now returned to you. Yes. And, you know, um, if you want to read a little bit about what this looks like, my case study, this was the last thing that uh, the client recognized is my, one parent taught me to be rigid in the way I do everything and the other had zero discipline. And I, now I can't take care of my life because I have zero skills. And they realized how to do that for themselves was to feel loved and like they could just do it. It wasn't, it didn't have to be a big deal, right? One of the things in recovery to pay attention to is the emotional habits that you have because some of your emotion is lying to you. And I know people don't like it <laughs> when, when we say things like that. Some of your emotion is not true, it's just a habit. So here's an example of what I'm talking about. For me personally, I have lifelong, probably starting in fifth or sixth grade, lifelong had this experience that if I don't get distressed before I have to do work, especially if it's work I don't really want to do, like vacuuming on Tuesday or something where I feel I'm going to be judged for it, I just had a habit of having this frenetic energy. And literally one day I realized, huh, this energy is not at all attached to the job or the outcome. And it's not serving me. Yeah. So as we're talking about recovery, just remember that some of your emotions are going to give you really solid information about where you're hurting and how to recover. And some are going to keep you stuck in your patterns. And discerning right. that is is the process. Yeah, because as you just said, you know, in your um, in the case study that you wrote about that client, which you can find in the Journal of Energy Psychology, is that right? Correct. And it's um, also on my it, website. Yeah. Oh, good. And then we can, I was going to say we could put a link in the show notes, but that's how someone could find it. When Tabitha says that a client, that it, the revelation, the searing psychological revelation is I can just do it. If that sounds a nuts or B like magic, believe us when we say there's a part of you, there's a wisdom in you that underneath that blame, those emotional habits um, is there and never went away. And so, you know, the part of you that's like, oh, maybe I'll just try this new thing. Maybe I'll just try this. Or, oh, tomorrow I will just um, wash my dish after I use it. You know, whatever it is, that there is a wisdom in you that um, is not magical. Mm -hmm. It's just this capacity for your own self-nurturance, self-care, self-protection, wisdom, spirituality, et cetera. And um, what, we, what we're talking about when it comes to responsibility, again, is I could say for the rest of my life, well, I didn't get my needs met right when I needed them. So, you know, 
I'm just not going to do anything about that. And then I've always got someone to blame for how my life is going. Let us stop you. Let us stop you. That's not living. Living in blame of other people who are old, sick, traumatized, lonely, you know, even though they wouldn't admit it, is not you living. It's you recreating and staying in that like highly traumatized state. So when it comes to responsibility and recovery, it's yours. I want to say a couple of things because we're we're bumping up on our time. And we've always okay. said, you know, we want to say like, one or two takeaways or things we want you to take with you today. Um, you, oh boy. And, and like, this is, this is shorthand, but let me say to you folks, you can't skip the line. If you come to me and tell me, well, I've already forgiven my parents and I just don't really think about it. And like, that doesn't ever, and you've got that tone of voice that you sound like a disembodied doll head off of like head off of body, ker pop. And you're like, yeah, None of that bothers me. And then you tell me about all your anxiety and how your inner critic sounds and the way that you beat yourself to heck every time things either do or don't go your way. With all the tenderness and love I have in my heart for you, I'm going to go, yeah, I don't buy that. I don't buy that. No disrespect, man. But like, it doesn't sound, so the words and the actions are not matching up. Spiritual bypass fake forgiveness mm -hmm. you say fake like you know it and you're lying i mean it hurts so bad that you don't want to go touch it so it would be better to just say you're okay even mm -hmm. though you're not and that sounds patternistic of this whole system as well who's That's responsible what I... for keeping their seat when their parents get angry why you are instead of the other way around, where it is the parent's job to keep their seat. And what I mean is not lose their marbles. When their kid is like, I'm angry, I'm going to have a meltdown. I've got huge feelings. I just peed on the floor in the kitchen and now I'm cleaning it up with my play mop. And you're like, no, ah, it's your job to stay calm, not the child's job to like, look at you, lose your, your stuff. And then go, okay, well, let me stay calm because at least then I won't make things worse. Right. And uh, that's not always simple, Beth. Like when your 15-year-old tells you you're a hypocrite and they're right. <laughs> and they're right. <laughs> and they're right. Mm -hmm. So it's the, there's layers. And there's um, the other thing I'll have happen is clients will come to me and say, I thought I worked through this already. I thought I worked through this already. I don't want to go back and do more of this. I thought I worked through this already. And I would say to, I say to them, and I would say to anyone, a really wise AIT therapist that I used to, um, I, I went to a training with actually, she was like, it's more like you shave away another layer and then you shave away another layer. And you might find yourself feeling like you're at the exact same spot that you were two years ago, but it is different. Mm -hmm. because you have more insight, you have a, a more soothed nervous system, you have greater capacity to understand yourself and keep your own seat when you are having big feeling. It's not dissociation, but there's a part of you that can actually look at younger you and go, ooh, you're big mad, huh? And little you can be like, yeah! And like your wiser self or your like higher order functioning can go, well, then let's be with that instead of suppress it. I don't want to hear it or let me go, you know, scream at my kid. Yeah. If you want to be a cycle breaker, you got to be a cycle breaker and do it differently. And that takes a lot of effort. Yeah. So if we're if we're at the place where we're giving one last thing to think about, um, what I would like to pop in here isn't really a technique or a skill, but an idea yeah. so that you're aware that it may happen as you grow and find your own power, which is already there. It's yeah. already there for you, right? Oh, yeah. There is something that happens during the process of therapy and of healing if you're not doing it in, if you're doing it in a different context, because people can heal a lot of different ways, right? But there is a, an idea that as you heal, you're going to have an experience that can feel very much like grief for a lot of us, but it's actually an experience of a void. 
Yeah. Right. And so the void is if I don't do it this way, ah, I don't know what else to do. Right. So, for example, I recognized in that uh, example I was giving just a minute ago about freneticism before work. There it was this as I realized that there was a gap of, oh, my gosh, well, if I don't do that, then who am I? That is how deep it felt. If I don't freak out, who am I? And all that we needed to do, we, me, is take the pause. And I've said that before. When you feel like you don't know what to do, take the pause. Yeah. So if that void is coming up for you and you feel dislocated or disoriented or like you don't know or empty because you've had this spot inside of your heart that should feel connected to your deepest self actually being full of rage or grief for your entire life, that void is real and it's good, even if it feels scary. So those are my wrap up thoughts. Avoid, yeah, if, you avoid heal, if, right. if you heal, avoid is coming, yeah. <laughs> right? And we have to have the avoid to stop avoiding. And so then you can fill it with who you actually are and people go, yeah. well, but I don't know who I am. Listen, go figure it out. That might yeah. be the sweetest, best uh, gift or like reason to live a life that you might ever experience uh, for the next 20 or 30 years. Just getting to know yourself. Um, I'm going to read a couple of um, core beliefs out of the despair matrix from AIT and from the denial matrix. The denial Great. matrix is, um, is pretty, pretty apropos to the very beginning part of this, where like, if what we said to you today has got you like vibrating and you don't feel good, um, maybe now's a good time to go get on Tab's website or go find um, go find a psychology today article about like coming out of denial around like trauma. Um, I'm going to read just a couple of them. Uh, nothing bad really happened to me. Um, this phrase is opposite is I have suffered traumas like everyone else. We've said mm. many times in this podcast, nobody gets out of their childhood without uh, events that um, that hurt them. Another one is I can't handle the anger, sadness, fear, or grief that, the, that remembering the truth will bring. Um, and then of course it's opposite is I can handle these things. Um, I'd rather live in a fantasy world than reality. Ooh, mm. Oh boy. Mm. It's not fun to identify that we are, we are living in a fantasy where, listen, to believe that you can control everything in your world is fantastical. And I don't yep. mean fantastic. I mean, nonsense. You're not that powerful. We're not in your movie. We love you. We're not in your movie. <laughs> and you're not in ours. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, I, I'm going to forego the despair matrix. Um, when you cut through the denial, whatever needs to come up, is um is what needs to come up and this is why we keep encouraging you time and again to go get help oh, there's a lot of ways to do that um mm -hmm. thanks to zoom and thanks to um you know like telehealth getting a therapist today is easier than it has ever been in i would say human history i agree that's cool totally cool and if in your area you're seeing a lot of wait lists get on one yeah yeah, it's get on one. still worth it to do it. You know, you can get on the internet, you can get on better help. You can find like a, what you can find somebody. Um, so we're at our time today. And this is, it's such a good topic because you, we conflate responsibility and blame and they're not the same thing because responsibility is a gift and blame is a story. Oof. And there's no power in blame. Right. And you're powerful. You, say it. You're, you're powerful. You are powerful. Find your power. And one of the places you're going to find your power is in your anger. So we're out of time today. We hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if you want to connect with us, you can go to the cptsdpodcast.com. Um, you can find Tabitha at. <laughs> you can find me all over the place. Google my name. I'll pop up for you. There are not many Tabitha Bird Weavers. There are not. <laughs> you lucky duck. Um, and as for me, um, 
I may be popping out doing some more continuing education here and there, uh, but mostly I just like resting and hanging out with my dog. So um, thanks for joining us today. We're so glad you came. Tab, you want to take us out of here? I sure do. Hey, everybody. Thank you. Like or share this if it moved you. We're here for you. We'd love to hear your reviews, your thoughts, your comments. You can continue to let us know what you'd like to hear about. We're grateful for you and hope that this will help bring you closer to finding gratitude for yourself. See you next time. Bye. Bye.